Hey, look at Daniel. Daniel was a young man in his teens when he was carried off to Babylon about 605 B.C. That was the first siege of Jerusalem. He came in, Nebuchadnezzar came in two more ways after that, but Daniel was accompanied by his three friends, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. You know them best as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That were their Babylonian names. And it's been historically assumed that Daniel was the author. I mean, it says in chapter 7 and chapter 9 through 12, I, Daniel, in the first person. And so Daniel is, is you know, without a doubt the author. However, uh, <laughs> some modern critics say that, you know, the way he predicted things so precisely, uh, the four kingdoms, which came 200 years after him, or 300 years or more, and the way he had everything precise, it had to be somebody after 170 AD that wrote this. It couldn't have been Daniel. So you doubt that God has the omnipotence and omniscience to speak to his prophet. That's what they're doing. And so a lot of these biblical critics are not Christians. They're not believers. They're just out there to poke holes in God's word. We see that a lot. Um, Daniel recorded his accounts. He was there for 70 plus years. And we come to chapter 6 and he's thrown in the, the lion's den. He's probably 85 years old or older at that point in time. He's an old man. And so you kind of lose track of that when you, when you see that, but uh, we'll, we'll talk about that shortly. The book itself tells us, like I said, that Daniel's the author, and Jesus affirmed that. In Matthew 24, verse 15, he says, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel. So even Christ himself gives Daniel the credit for writing the book. One note of interest is that uh, it's bilingual. Part of it is in Hebrew, part of it is in Aramaic. And we find that uh, most of it's Hebrew, but chapters 2, verse 4 through chapter 7, and your Bible should tell you that, said it was written in Aramaic. And the reason is not known, but even the oldest manuscripts go back and they confirm uh, the, the Aramaic never changed. It's the same even in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So it was all consistent throughout the, all the copies and, and uh, different scribes who had copied it from the manuscripts. What I want to do, though, just for a little sidebar, is to take a little journey to Babylon. I mean, we've talked about Babylon so much as we've gone through the prophets, but about the city itself. I mean, Daniel was there for more than 70 years. And I just, I was doing some research and I came across some archaeology. It was pretty fascinating. And they talked about uh, the city itself. It was built around the Tower of Babel, the biblical Tower of Babel. It was a favorite residence of Babylonian and Assyrian and Persian kings. Even Alexander the Great loved the city of Babylon. It was a magnificent city during the whole pre-Christian era. And during the 45 years of Nebuchadnezzar, he's the one that had beautified it. He is the one that, that built it up and made it into what it was. But listen to this description from the archaeologist. It was a walled city, of course. It was 60 miles around, so 15 miles square around the city of Babylon. It's mind-boggling, but the wall was 300 feet high, 80 feet thick, and went down 35 feet underground to prevent enemies from tunneling. It's a fantastic work of architecture when they ex excavated that. The bricks used were, uh, I think they said, one foot square and four inches thick to build the wall. And there was, from the wall to the actual city, there was another quarter mile of clear space. And then, of course, around the perimeter, they had moats uh, to, for protection. But the one thing about the city of Babylon was the river Euphrates ran right through the center of it. And we'll talk about that shortly, how that came into play uh, in their downfall. And it was truly a city of gold. There was uh, 53 temples of gold, 180 altars to Ishtar, which we talked earlier, that's the queen of heaven, in quote, air quotes, the queen of heaven. Um, there was a tunnel under the river that was 15, 15 feet wide and 12 feet high that they uncovered, that went underneath the river. So it's pretty amazing. So that's a little bit about Babylon, and it's pretty fascinating. I mean, I said, can you imagine a, a wall 300 feet high for 60 miles around? It was quite a feat that they did. But let's look then at an outline of Daniel. It's pretty simple because it's broken into two parts. The first six chapters would be the narratives about Daniel and his ministry. So chapter 1, we'll go through these briefly, and then we'll talk about them later on when we look at the themes. God's protection of Daniel and his friends for their faithfulness. Chapter 2, Daniel interprets Nebuchadnezzar's dream. 
chapter 3, faithful friends saved from the fiery furnace. And in chapter 4, it's a second dream and God's judgment and restoration to Nebuchadnezzar. Five is the feast of Belshazzar and the fall of Babylon. And then in chapter 6, God delivers Daniel from the lion's den. So that's the action and narratives take place. And then from chapter 7 to 12, it's the visions of Daniel. So he has these prophetic visions. And in chapter 7, it's the four beasts and the coming kingdom of God. In chapter 8, it's a vision of the ram and the goat. So it's a conquest of Persia, the rise of Greece. So he's given privy to the things that are going to happen in the future, uh, near future for him. 9 is a wonderful chapter of Daniel's prayer, repentance. And then we get this little section about the 70 weeks to come. And then chapters 10 through 12 is really one single vision to finish up the book. Uh, It tells us in chapter 10, the angel's message to Daniel. And then chapter 11, we have three different portions. The history of, uh, from Daniel to this man named Antiochus IV, who was an evil ruler. Uh, The rule of Antiochus from verse 21 to 35 of chapter 11. And then from the last part of chapter 11 to the first part of chapter 3, the final rule of the Antichrist. I mean, someone who was opposed to uh, the kingdom of God. And then finally, the end of chapter 12 is the final message to Daniel about the end of times. And there's some good lessons there for us as we're going to look at uh, having faith. So with that outline, let's look at some of the central themes and main events of Daniel. And of course, if you've read through Daniel, you can sit down. That's your homework this afternoon. It doesn't take that long. Read chapters 1 through 6 and then pause and then pick up 7 and 12. And don't try to, don't get caught up in the minutia of all these signs and symbols. It'll drive you crazy. But just simply realize that the purpose of it is to show the absolute sovereignty of God. That's what Daniel's trying to tell us. The temple might be in ruins. Jerusalem's destroyed. The people are in exile, but God is in control. And that's the main thing he's trying to tell us. God will work his purposes Nothing can stop his purposes, and he works for the glory of his own name. We see that throughout Scripture. Last week we talked about in Ezekiel, for the glory of my name. I didn't do it because you were good people. I did it for the glory of my name because I had made a covenant promise. And so no matter the circumstance. The other thing that's interesting, we touched upon this a little bit too last week, is that God used the greatest kingdom at the time, the Babylonians, to judge his people for their sin. And then in his sovereignty, he turns around and judges the Babylonians with a greater uh, group that came along, the Persians. We'll see that happens in chapter 5. And so the theology of Daniel is truly God-centered. It's all about what the Lord has done. The primary purpose of the prophet is to encourage the people to trust the Lord. He's the one who directs history. He's the one whose will can never be thwarted. And so he's going to compel the readers, us, those in the current time when he was writing and those after the exile, to put their faith in the Lord. And it doesn't matter if it's Babylon or Antiochus or Rome. It doesn't matter who the enemy is. Keep your eye on the coming Messiah. That's the one who's been promised to us. And so we get a little bit of that in chapter 7 we'll look at. There's this prophetic word about this one who was, who was going to come. And he even describes him. So it's the Messiah then who ultimately set the captives free. It's a Messiah who will destroy human kingdoms and bring in his kingdom, which will last for all eternity. All right? That's what we're supposed to have hope in. So let's go through some of the activity then of the first six chapters and look and see how God was directing things, how he's protecting his people. So chapter one, if you remember, Daniel and his young friends are in Babylon and uh, they're handsome men, they're, they're intelligent men, but they're given this diet of, you know, meats and probably a lot of sweets and wine to drink. And Daniel said, no, I don't want to do that. He asked the eunuch who's in charge of him, give us fruits, I mean, uh, vegetables and water and see how we do. And he says, well, no, if you guys don't look good, it's going to be my head. He says, give me 10 days. Feed us this for 10 days and then check us and see. And after the end of 10 days, sure enough, Daniel and his three friends looked better than everybody else. God gave them favor. Daniel did not, did not want to uh, end up eating food that had been offered to idols, etc. And so he wanted to keep himself pure. God honored that. Chapter 2, we have this 
uh, dream that the king has of this statue. But he doesn't know what it means. And so, it, if you read it, it's crazy what he did. He brought in all the uh, enchanters and all his astrologers and all his wise men. He didn't just want the interpretation. He wanted them to tell them what the dream was. They're supposed to know what he was dreaming inside his own head. And he said, if you can't do that, I'm going to kill all of you. And so, God steps forward then through Daniel after some prayer. And Daniel goes, and he not only he, the, interprets his dream, he tells the king what his dream was. Pretty phenomenal. That God was protecting him. And so he gives him this dream. And what is it? He's learned about four kingdoms to come. He says, you know, Nebuchadnezzar, you are the, you are the head of gold of this statue. And then there's silver, and there's bronze, and there's iron, and then there's feet of iron and clay mixed. And then he's told about a stone, a stone that will come and will crush that statue, bring down those kingdoms. And he says, "...that shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever." In Luke 20, 18, that Ben preached on just recently, Jesus said of the stone that had been rejected by the builders, everyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him, the enemies of God. Chapter 3, God protects his three men in the fiery furnace. In fact, the king looked in and he said, I see a fourth one looks like a son of the gods, small g. Was that perhaps an angel or was it a pre-incarnate Christ? We don't know, but there was a fourth one there protecting them. And they weren't even, they didn't smell like smoke. I'd grow in my backyard for an hour and make some hamburgers. I'm covered with smoke. <laughs> and like they were in the midst of it and they, they didn't have any singed hair or anything. It was amazing. In chapter 4, God humbles this proud king, Nebuchadnezzar, for a time. And finally, at the end of time, he ends up praising and honoring the king of heaven. If you remember that story, he goes out and he becomes like a wild animal. His hair grows long, his nails grow long, he eats grass. We don't know if it was seven days, seven weeks. Probably to get nails that long, it was at least seven weeks, maybe longer. It just says in period of, of seven, and that's God's complete number. But he ends up honoring and praising the God of Daniel, that there is no other God like him. And that was the purpose of him being humbled. He thought he was in charge of everything, and he realizes he's not. And then in chapter 5, the final king of Babylon, Belshazzar, holding this great banquet. And what they're using, their utensils and their cups, they were drinking wine out of the cups they'd taken from the temple in Jerusalem. Just a slap in the face to God. And so we have this hand that comes and writes on the wall. And you've heard that term used, the writing's on the wall. And this is where it came from. Daniel, then, is the only one who can interpret it because it's in Aramaic. And basically what it says is to Belshazzar, your kingdom is coming to an end. You've been weighed in the balance and you've been found wanting and your kingdom's going to be divided and given to someone else. And that very night, he was taken out. And here's how they did it. This is what the experts believe. I mentioned earlier that the Euphrates River ran right through the center of Babylon and it's believed that somewhere upstream, maybe a place where it wasn't as wide, the, the uh, Persian army had diverted the stream, the river, to a different place, and those who were near the wall went in under the riverbed and entered the city that way. That's what they believe happened. And so that beautiful part the, with the river running through ended up being the downfall for the Babylonian Empire. They diverted the Euphrates River. And then in chapter 6, Daniel, who's now an old man, we know that because it's no longer a Babylonian king, it's King Darius who's the first king of the Medo-Persians. He was waiting for Cyrus to come back from conquest, so Darius was in charge for a, a, a while. And so this is the king, so you know he's been there at least 70 years. He's an old man. And how are they going to attack? How are they going to attack an old man who's been so faithful but to attack his faith in the Lord? And so they made this decree. If anyone prays, O king, to anyone other than you, let him be cast into the den of lions. And so, of course, Daniel's not going to stop. He's been doing this for over 70 years, praying to God. And they catch him doing it. And we talked earlier when we had Esther, that the decrees of the Persians cannot be taken away once they have been decreed. 
So the king has no choice but to cast him in the den of lions. And he had a restless night wondering what was going to happen. And he gets up in the morning, and sure enough, Daniel was protected. But the men who had accused him and their wives and their children were all cast into the den of lions. God was protecting his prophet. You can see that all through those first six chapters. That was the purpose of that. So now we come to a little change in the scenery, and uh, I actually put a red line across here that, that it's, it's going to change. And what we want to make sure is that we don't get caught up in the details about dates and times and numbers. And I'll say that again probably before we're finished. But rather we want to show how God was working in the affairs of history to bring about his purposes. That was the whole reason for this. And so in chapter 7, Daniel has a vision of four beasts. And it's kind of a continuation of that statue in chapter 2 where he has these four kingdoms. And these four beasts come along. They're very frightening, terrifying symbolism. But in the midst of the frightening sights, Daniel is comforted because he hears these words. And I mentioned we'd hear about this of a, of a coming Messiah. And look at chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. We see judgment upon this evil man who has come, this one who had wreaked havoc. And verse 9 says, I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousand served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. And then down to verse 13. We, this, is, this is some of the same uh, vision that John had in the book of Revelation that we see. Verse 13, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, remember, it, it, Ben talked about that last week, coming in the, in the clouds. It's not like he's surfing, like he said, he's not surfing in the clouds, but he, it's the symbolism of God's presence. And there came one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days, and was presented before him. And to him... This son of man was given dominion and a glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. So in the midst of this terrible vision, he gets comforted by knowing that God's in control and there's one who's going to come who's going to have a, an everlasting kingdom. All these kingdoms beforehand, they're nothing. They're just mere men and they're turned to dust. But the one who's going to come will have an eternal kingdom. And so we see judgment then over in verse 25 against this one. We don't know if it's looking forward to this Antiochus or maybe it's uh, somebody in the future. We would call him an Antichrist. Verse 25, speaking of that person, he shall speak words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and shall think to change the times and the law and they shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. But the court shall sit in judgment and his dominion shall be taken away to be consumed and destroyed to the end. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. His kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Isn't that great? What comfort he gets in the midst of this terrifying vision. So we'll go to chapter 8 then, and we have this ram and this goat. This one we don't have to guess at because he has told the interpretation. Over in verses 20 to 22, the ram represents the kings of Media and Persia. The goat represents the king of Greece. And Media and Persia, that ram's just trampling over everything until the goat comes. And the goat comes, and man, he just destroys them all. And that's, we know now that would be Alexander the Great. In 331 B.C., he defeated the Persian kingdom. But he died at a young age of 33 and his kingdom then, the kingdom of Greece, was broken into four lesser kingdoms. And two of those, one was the Seleucids, which would be Syria, and the Ptolemies in Egypt. And those two, you know, had it out. And we, we see that throughout the period between the Testaments. And so the little horn in verse 9 most likely is speaking of this man named Antiochus IV. And that's why people thought that Daniel was written later because he was such detail about this guy. He was part of that Seleucid, the, the Syrian branch. And through much intrigue, he became the leader. He called himself Epiphanes, 
which means God manifest. So he's Antiochus IV, but he named himself Epiphanes. I am God in flesh, basically what he's saying. What pride. And he ruled from 175 to 164 BC, and he was definitely an enemy of God's people. He tried to destroy the Jewish religion. He even went into the temple and sacrificed a pig on the altar. And perhaps that's what's called the abomination of desolation that Daniel was speaking of, that Jesus mentioned in Matthew 24. But the strange thing is, it already happened at the time of Jesus, so there's another abomination coming. We'll look at that shortly. And so in this context, he may be the forerunner of a more terrible destroyer that was coming in the future, even after that, uh, perhaps the Antichrist, one who will come at the future and mar the closing days of history. He may be looking forward to Rome in 70 AD. That may have been the second abomination. It's called a double prophecy. So what I'm saying is Daniel talked about an abomination. Antiochus fulfilled it. And then Jesus said there's another one when you see the abomination of desolation coming. And he may have been speaking of Rome just 40 years after his execution. Or it may be something not fulfilled yet. We don't need to have to worry about that, right? God's in control. That's why we don't want to get into all speculation about it. We come to chapter 9, and Daniel, wow. If you, want to, if you want to be humbled, read chapter 9. Read Daniel's prayer. He's been reading the book of Jeremiah, which we studied a couple weeks ago. And he realizes the time of the exile was 70 years. Well, 70 years has come to pass. And so in sackcloth and ashes, he goes into prayer. And he uses the pronouns we and us for the people of God. He's taking... He's culpable for that himself. He says, we have disobeyed you. We have violated your holy name. We have not done what we should have done. He's been there since he was 15 years old. He was serving the Lord, but in humility, he goes before the Lord. It's a wonderful prayer. Asking for the Lord. Now, the time is up that you said, Lord, please, in your mercy, can we end this exile so people can go back to their homeland? And while he's praying, he gets a visitor. The angel Gabriel appears to him. And says, yes, this will, be, this will be over. But Daniel, he's told that there will yet be 70 weeks until the Messiah comes. And this is where the debate comes in. What do they mean by the 70 weeks? Um, look at, that, at chapter 9, verses 24, and the first part of 25. The angel tells him, 70 weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression to put an end to sin and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and prophet, and to anoint a most holy place. Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks. And then there's 62 weeks, and then there's another time. So we're not going to get caught up in that. I mean, they'd say that, well, 70 times 7 is 490 years, and you can take this date and see this date and you can try to match it up, but that's just all speculation. We just don't know for sure. Daniel's even told not to worry about it. We'll look at that shortly too. So, you're supposed to trust the Lord in all things. We come to verse, uh, chapter 10 and look at 10 through 12. It's all part of a single vision that he's given. And in the beginning he learns that an angel has come to give him a message because of his persistence in prayer and his humility in prayer, he's been highly honored by the Lord. That's encouraging for us to hear. The saints are honored by God, and our prayers are heard by him. And so he hears about the angel Michael, who fights for God's people in the heavenly realms. Daniel has no reason to fear, nor do we, because we know the Lord will achieve his final victory over the, it uses the term principalities and powers, formed against the God of heaven. And when you hear those words, I just go to Ephesians 6. Chapter 6 of Paul's letter to the Ephesians, he writes this in verses 10 through 12. As he's giving words to them, he says, Finally, be strong in the Lord, in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Daniel's getting the same message. It's not flesh and blood. Let God handle these things. And in chapter 11, 
the revelation given to Daniel really is in three parts. He's, he's given three parts of, of history coming near to him. Verses 2 to 20 depict in pretty precise detail the history of the ancient Near East from the time of Daniel until this Antiochus IV, which is going to cover uh, from 500 or so to about uh, 170. So the next three to 400 years, he's given that. And then verses 21 to 35 describes the rule of Antiochus IV. And then verses uh, 36 of chapter 11 to verse 1 of chapter 12 apparently describe the time of the Antichrist. We don't know if it's looking at, was looking at the time of Rome, it's looking at something in the future. Yet for us, we don't know. But again, I want to stress we don't get caught up in dates and numbers. Simply trust in the word of the Lord. We're told in Isaiah 46, 8 to 10, the Lord speaking through the prophet, I am God, there is no other. I am God, there's none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things not yet done. Saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish my purpose. God's speaking to us. Don't get caught up in the minutia. Don't worry. Keep your eye on the main things and make sure you're in my scripture. Make sure you are in prayer. Be highly honored like Daniel was. As we come to close in chapter 12 then, Daniel learns of an impending persecution of God's saints, a time like we have never seen before. Jesus talked about that too as, as Ben's been preaching. A time of uh, great trouble coming up. Perhaps that was 70 AD when the Romans came in. But he also learns of the glorious vindication and the mention of bodily resurrection. Did you catch that if you read chapter 12? Look what he says. Verses 1 to 3 it said, that time shall arise Michael, the great prince, who has charge of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above. And those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. And look what he's told in verse 4. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. But what's he told? Don't worry about it. I'm giving you everything you need to know. You don't need to know any more than this. This is what's going to happen at the end. Put your faith and trust in me. And when Daniel asks how these things will come to pass in the final analysis, he's told two more times. The angel informed him that he was not to know. He said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. And then down the last verse of, the, of chapter 12, and this is how his book ends. <clears throat> In verse 13, he's told again by the angel, go your way till the end, and you shall rest and shall stand at your allotted place at the end of the days. No anxiety, Daniel. I'm in control. Go your way. Don't worry about the details. I've got it all under cover. I'm taking care of it all. Comforting words for the prophet, comforting words for us in the 21st century. Daniel reminds us of the importance of having faith in the covenant-keeping God. Hope you can see that. Study them. Know the, know the words of God. Study them. Know them. Rest in them. That's what we're to do. So hopefully now when you look at Daniel, you'll, you'll be able to see that he was... He was so faithful to God, and God gave him great wisdom, uh, great information, but just enough he needed to get by, not too much to cause anxiety. Um, so anybody have any questions or comments about Daniel? Um,